He was an American hero, climbing from orphaned obscurity to the presidency. She was a frontier aristocrat, born to one of Tennessee's first families. She chose true love over society's rules. As a nation watched their marriage slandered for political gain, their love endured and became legend for romance novels, even the silver screen. Great show. Rachel and Andrew Jackson's romance is kind of a classic. You know, passionate young love. There's nothing that was going to keep those two apart. Love is a place, even its own sun and moon and stars. Rachel Jackson. And the persecution she has suffered has endeared her more, if possible, than ever to me, Andrew Jackson. She did something heroic and something quite extraordinary and unacceptable. It's the story of a dedicated wife married to a hero husband. Her sacrifice may have cost the ultimate price, her life. Rachel and Andrew Jackson, a love story. Rachel Donaldson, one of 11 children, was the youngest daughter and favorite child of wealthy Virginia landowner Colonel John Donaldson. She came of age during a unique time in the nation's history. People were going west searching for the American dream. Rachel took the journey by water on a flat boat called the Adventure. Her father led his family and a small party of mainly women and children on a thousand mile journey ending on the Cumberland River. It was one of the most ambitious river voyages ever recorded. But it was a rough river, and it was not a joy ride by any means for anybody on it. They were worried about Indians and apparently were fired on. Legend says 12-year-old Rachel pulled her own weight, rowing the huge wooden oars and even steering the boat while her father fended off Indian attacks. She's a really an extraordinary woman when you consider what she went through as a young girl, coming, you know, from the east with the first families of Tennessee out into the wilderness. Their destination, the last outpost of the American frontier. White men called it Fort Nashboro, today Nashville, Tennessee. Life was hard and dangerous, but the challenges of an unknown landscape nourished a spirit of freedom that shaped girls like Rachel into more independent, risk-taking women. The experience would be her rite of passage to a life where enemies would prove far more daunting than just the elements of the frontier. The Donaldson settlement was anything but settling. Indian attacks were frequent enough to scare the family back east to more civilized Harrodsburg, Kentucky. Rachel grew into one of the most eligible women in her circle. The 17-year-old was described as beautiful, vivacious, and the best storyteller on the Western Front. She was a seemingly perfect match for the dashing young revolutionary war hero, Louis Robarts. She was kind of, I think, a romantic. You know, and this was her first crush, possibly. In any event, she married in haste. Soon after the wedding, her family returned to Tennessee. Living as a new bride in Kentucky, her romantic ideals dissolved into a harsh reality. He was insanely jealous. Any man who looked at her, you see, he was sure she was encouraging him, you know, or inviting it. And there were many, many scenes. The woman's life was such that once you were married, you were subject to your husband. And even though he abused you, you were expected to suffer it and, and go on with your life. What happened up there, we don't know. Did he send her home, or did she go home? Well, we don't really know that either. But the net result was um, she vacated her husband's bed and board and went back to live with her mother. Returning to the Cumberland Valley, Rachel had changed. No longer the brash young frontier girl full of hope and promise. She was now a young woman of 21 fearful of life and the future, a future that would literally come to her door. When Jackson goes out to 
Nashville, 1788. Rachel is living with her widowed mother, Donaldson. He, of course, seeks a room and board and finds it there. Andrew Jackson was a newly arrived young lawyer from North Carolina. Uh, he moved in, and that's how Rachel and Andrew met. Was it love at first sight? Who knows? Uh, what all entered into this is not documented. And um, we do know that the love affair stuck, if that's any evidence. At 21, Jackson's chivalry was already legendary. His mother had died saving him and other soldiers in the Revolutionary War. From then on, rescuing women in distress was a lifelong passion. You have to realize there's no male figure in his early life. His father is dead, and the most important role is played by his mother. And he talks about her later in life. I wish my mother had lived to see this. In Rachel, he saw the chance to be the savior he wasn't with his mother. In Andrew, Rachel saw a way out. Is it possible that Rachel, in a bad marriage, could begin to believe, you know, is this the rest of my life? Or will God Almighty somehow send a rescuer? You know, the Cinderella idea of Prince Charming. Prince Charming, her present husband, was not. Robards followed Rachel to Tennessee and tried to reconcile. But old habits die hard, and soon his suspicions led to accusation involving Rachel and Andrew. I mean, he was absolutely certain you know, that they were carrying on an affair. Jackson actually threatened him. You know, he was going to cut off his ears. Apparently on the frontier, one of the ways you showed your annoyance with somebody else. And of course, then the husband just took off. Rachel and Andrew were now alone. They attract one another. They're two wild people in the beginning. You, they say opposites attract, but there was something in her, you know, that was fun-loving. And that's what Lewis Robards couldn't stand. He read all kinds of things into it. And, and she'd have to play this awful role to be his wife, and she couldn't stand it. After rumors that Robards was returning to claim her a second time, Rachel left her family and fled down the Mississippi River to Natchez. Again, the water would lead her to a new life. Jackson went along for protection, but wouldn't stay long. Back in Nashville practicing law, he learned that Louis Robards was pursuing a divorce. He quickly returned to Natchez to share the news with Rachel. They would leave Mississippi together, traveling up the Natchez Trace, this time as man and wife. No record of the Natchez marriage survives. She just fell for him. She realized what she had and, and, and what was possible, and she went for it. I give her credit. Back in Tennessee, the Jacksons start a new life, their love an elixir for past heartache. Jackson, of course, was totally orphaned at the age of 14 had no money, had no prospects, had very little education by the time he was 14. That's pretty bad. He never acknowledged any family in South Carolina, and he had them. He wanted nothing more to do with them. So it says something about, I'm leaving all of this you know, heartbreak behind. And he found a new life that brought joy. And it wasn't simply Rachel. It was a whole family that was warm and loving. The marriage filled a void for both of them. For Rachel, she finally found true love. For Andrew, a sense of place, a family, the right kind of family for a man with drive and ambition. He's marrying into the first one of the first families of uh, Tennessee. And I don't doubt that that may have played a part, you know, in what he was trying to achieve. How much of this was calculation? I don't know. As so long as this remains, you know, one of the astonishing love matches, 
of all the presidential histories. Uh, you can't depreciate the value of a strong attraction between them. But it didn't hurt that she was a better social station than he was. Practically all United States presidents married above their station. Two years into their marriage, they learned an awful truth. Louis Robards had started the divorce process, but never followed through. Technically, he and Rachel were still married. According to the law, she was an adulteress and a bigamist. They thought the filing of divorce had occurred, but it didn't. Uh, Robards waited a couple of years after he had been authorized by the Virginia legislature to sue in the courts of Kentucky. He didn't do it. In 1793, he finally took the case to a Kentucky court. Rachel was convicted for desertion and adultery. After the verdict, one journalist said the gossip the case entailed changed Mrs. Jackson's whole view of life. From a bright, fun-loving young woman, Rachel became a grave, reserved matron. As Rachel got older, she became extremely religious. A church was built for her on the grounds of the Hermitage, and she was said to possess a rousing, evangelical, near-fanatical piety. One said she spent a life paying for her youthful, illicit love. Jackson also spent a life making up for her suffering. As a lawyer, he felt he should have been absolute on the status of Rachel's divorce before marrying her. Jackson, the story goes, was quite indignant. He said, I've already married her once. I'm not going to do it again. Uh, his good friend John Overton said, just be on the safe side. I think maybe you'd better. Uh, so they were married again. Now more than ever, he stood ready to defend her honor at any cost. If anybody said anything that was negative or implied something wrong, immoral, it would trigger, you know, an explosion. As when John Sevier said, the only thing you have ever done is run off with another man's wife. He lost, he lost control. John Sevier was running for governor of Tennessee at the time. Jackson challenged him to a duel. Sir, you without provocation made the attack and in an ungentlemanly manner took the sacred name of a lady in her polluted lips and dared me publicly to challenge you. Adieu, Andrew Jackson. No lives were lost, but the political casualty was great for Jackson. Though the severe duel was aborted, three years later he fought a second duel, killing a man and walking away with a permanent bullet in his chest. Few knew he was injured, and many believed he was a merciless murderer. Virtually a social outcast, he retreated from public service and concentrated on his private life with Rachel. In 1812, Jackson made his way back into public view, leading troops to New Orleans for the war against Britain. As Major General, he was often rash and unpredictable. Of all his compatriots, there was only one who could calm him, Rachel. She really tamed him. And she's always the strong person. She's the only one who could ever control him. And when she's gone, there isn't anybody else. Yet in Andrew's absence, Rachel is weak, sinking into deep depressions, suffering from severe headaches and all night crying fits. She was very dependent. He writes to his brother-in-law, tells her, you know, please check in on Mrs. Jackson. I left her. Bathed in tears. Indeed, sir, it has given me more pain than any event in my life. Esteem, your friend sincerely, Andrew Jackson. We have very few Rachel letters to Andrew, but they are always filled with, uh, you've gone off and left me again, <laughs> and I hate it. Uh, she wanted him there, and she picked the wrong man. My dearest life, I received your letter. Never shall I forget it. I have not slept one night since. You have been gone a long time, six months. What has been your trials, dangers, and difficulties? Oh, Lord of heaven, how can I bear it? Your dearest friend and faithful wife until death, Rachel Jackson. Rachel's only relief during the long absences was her family. Though the Jacksons never had children of their own, 
They cared for many, even adopting one of her brother's twin sons, Andrew Jackson Jr. They also cared for an orphaned Indian boy named Linkoya, who was found on the battlefield, alive in his dead mother's arms. My dear, keep Linkoya in the house. He is a savage, but one that fortune has thrown in my hands. He may have been given to me for some valuable purpose. In fact, when I reflect, his relation is so much like myself, I feel an unusual sympathy for him. Your affectionate husband, Andrew Jackson. In 1823, Rachel again is left alone at the Hermitage. Now a U.S. Senator, Andrew is nominated for president while in Washington. In 1824, Jackson runs against John Quincy Adams. He wins the popular and electoral vote, but his lack of majority throws the presidential election into the House of Representatives. The Speaker of the House, Henry Clay, used his influence to swing the vote to Jackson's opponent. Jackson really felt, uh, you know, he won the election of 1824, and they took it away from him, and they elected John Quincy Adams in what everybody suspected was a really corrupt bargain. You know, you do for me and I'll do for you. You make me president, I'll make you secretary of state. And that's what happened. From the moment Adams took the oath of office, Jackson resolved he would win the White House and vengeance four years later. In 1828, Jackson ran against Adams a second time. Never before had the American people witnessed such malice. Called the dirtiest campaign in American history, it has yet to be rivaled. There was no end to the, the new issues that were brought up. Jackson was called a murderer uh, because of the execution of six militiamen. And they then accused John Quincy Adams of being a pimp, that he had pimped an American girl for the Tsar of Russia. Adams retaliated, charging Jackson with dueling, gambling, slave trading, war crimes, and treason. And it didn't stop there. Both sides then took aim at the candidate's loved ones. You stole another man's wife! Everything became an issue in the campaign of 1828. It was a whole different ball game. The attacks upon Rachel Jackson were unprecedented. Claiming Rachel Jackson was unfit to be first lady, the press depicted her as a pipe-smoking country bumpkin. One newspaper compared the lady of General Jackson to a dirty black wench. Another posed, if General Jackson is elected, what effect will it have upon American youth? The Cincinnati Gazette broke the story of her first marriage, asking, ought a convicted adulteress and her paramour husband be placed in the highest offices of this free and Christian land? Rachel was devastated. Already grieving from Lincoya's death that summer, her health was rapidly failing. For a, re a woman who is very religious, who believes in her savior, to hear people say that she is this awful person who has, is vile, who has committed these great crimes against the Ten Commandments, I don't doubt that it, it weakened her. She knew what was going on from the beginning. Uh, all of the strategy sessions that took place at the Hermit, she would have been privy to what they were planning as a way of defense. So, of course it hurt her. It hurt Jackson even worse. This time, Andrew couldn't save her. No longer could he lose control, fire a shot, or challenge a duel. After all, the presidency was at stake. How hard it is to keep the cowhide from some of these villains. Being placed in a situation that I cannot act and punish those slanders not only of me but Mrs. Jackson, is a sacrifice too great to be well endured. Andrew Jackson. The fact that they considered themselves married and the whole community accepted, it only became an issue in 1827, 1828 as part of a presidential campaign. Nobody blinked an eye about it before then. This was a good, devoted couple. They're married. 
The rest of the country agreed, electing Jackson our seventh president by an overwhelming majority. The campaign of 1828 signaled a turning point in American history. Not only was it the dirtiest campaign, but it was also the first to involve the American people in the political process. Free from restrictions like land ownership and religious affiliation, many white men cast their first vote for Jackson. He becomes a hero to the American people. He helps them prove to themselves and the whole world that this nation has won its independence and created a new form of government, not a monarchical one, not a dictatorial one, but a Republican, democratic system. The once orphaned boy now claimed the White House his home, but at what cost to Rachel? She hated Washington. She didn't want to go there. She knew she had to when he was elected president. And she says, for the general, I am very happy, happy that he was elected. For myself, I never wanted it. I would rather be the doorkeeper in the house of God than live in that palace in Washington. Rachel Jackson. Her wish was tragically prophetic. Several days before a ball to celebrate their victory, Rachel Jackson collapsed. The doctor had bled her, and it didn't do any good. No blood came out, you know, it didn't flow. And Jackson, he said, try her temple, if you can believe it. And he made an incision on her temple, and two drops stained her cap, they said, that, that, that she wore. And she died. And he, you know, he was, uh, he lost his voice. Uh, he stayed, you know, by, by her body. He said, my heart is nearly broke. And that's true. Wore a weeper, you know, a black band around his hat. He always wore black after that. On the day of her funeral, newspaper accounts say the road to the hermitage was impassable. Poor white people, slaves, friends, and neighbors filled the large garden. During the service, church bells rang across Tennessee. Three weeks later, a grieving husband left for his inauguration in Washington. He stayed in a state of deep mourning for the rest of his life. Now, she died in 28, and he died in 45, so that's pretty long, long, deep mourning. The idea that the dirty campaign, especially the slurs against Rachel personally and upon the marriage, uh, the idea that this precipitated her death, um, maybe there's some truth in it. The important part of it is Jackson believed it, and his political enemies got slapped for this one in the most effective way. As soon as he had the power, of the presidency. A lot of perks uh, that the people he held responsible for attacking his wife were taken away. And a good many of them found themselves before federal courts. While in the White House, General Jackson built a shrine to his beloved wife. He really blew it all out with the tomb. <laughs> It was really a most unusual thing for its purpose and time. Uh, it is a little gazebo, uh, a, a Greek temple of love is what it amounts to. Gazebos were usually called temples of love because they were great trysting places. And the fact that he put it in the garden and insisted on planting willow trees who did all the weeping and lots of flowers in particular roses, it is, it is more life uh, than it is death. After serving two presidential terms, he came home to the Hermitage. His granddaughter, little Rachel, said he visited the garden every night. He missed her every day, and perhaps every moment of every day. It was, um, it was a completion for him to come back there after the presidency. He aspired to nothing more than to be united with his wife in heaven. 
My dearest heart, it is with great pleasure I sit down to write you. Though I'm absent, my heart rests with you. With what pleasing hopes I view the future period when I shall be restored to your arms. I mean to retire and spend my time with you alone, which is my only ambition and ultimate wish. Your affectionate husband, Andrew Jackson. Ultimately, a wife's love and a husband's ambition collided. Rachel's sacrifice for Andrew's political career may have cost him her. So you have these two unique American types that are emerging, that are leading this country into a new era. With Andrew Jackson, you're getting the real thing. He comes from obscurity. He comes from no place. He's an orphan. And he becomes the first gentleman of the land. He becomes the president of the United States. They even invented a term, the self-made man. It's something we believe in now. And he meets this extraordinary woman who comes out as a child into the wilderness and is brought up on a frontier. You know, the whole women's rights movement is a story of women coming into their own. Rachel is in there. They absolutely depended on one another, helped one another, and lived for one another. That's what makes this relationship so remarkable. And the fact that it had so many disagreeable things in it in the past that they've overcome it doesn't come, you know, without cost. And he, and he recognized that after she was gone. She paid for it in many ways. She is now in the bliss of heaven, and I know that she can suffer no more on earth. That is enough for my consolation. My loss is her gain. 